Hello there. Thank you for tapping over to this podcast, where in this episode revolves around a theme. That theme is really the virtue of keeping things simple. See, one of the paradoxes in our Western culture is that we often use simple as a synonym with stupid or homely, and otherwise a label to mean nothing to get excited about, while at the same time, we often degrade any high-minded complexity for being too nerdish and boring, leading us to wander around in the dark, constantly on the search for a perfect Goldilocks zone that just doesn't exist. In the fitness industry that my guest is an expert in, that will lead many of us to chase down one fad diet or exercise routine just to get on another one when that burns us out. For some of us, that fad is just the thing that we need to get a habit started, and then we're off on our own. For others, it'll stick us in a rut that we just don't climb out of. All the while, the soul that keeps a simple foundation and doesn't shy away from it has been chugging along at a steady rate without any injury. My guest, Dr. Yusuf Smith, who recently joined us in episode 36, is a doctor and fitness instructor in the UK. From those two worlds, he gets a unique position of both trying to get people to be a peak bodybuilder, while also attempting to get others up to basic health. This puts him face to face with both extremes of the world, those who may refuse to get healthy, and those that might be a bit too okay with brutalizing their body for the sake of gains. Here's his secret sauce of a happy medium. Lift weights at least two to three times per week in a combination of horizontal press, vertical press, same with pulling exercises and leg exercises. Just do whatever you can pain-free. Find successes in the small movement of doing it and just keep building. Now, if you take that happy medium and you do that every week for two years, that'll get you 80% of the progress. You'll have better bone density, cardio, you'll likely live longer, you'll have a mental uplift, and overall you'll be able to rule out a wide array of chronic health issues. That's it. Simple. But simple doesn't mean easy. Honestly, I think the simplest habits are the hardest to make because we can see them as so trivial. Going to the gym frequently can become so routine we can easily talk ourselves out of a day or two because there's another one coming to make it up. The truth is, as Yusuf so brilliantly puts it, that time is going to pass anyway. Two years will come in a blink of an eye. If you want more evidence for that, look no further than what's been happening with COVID. It already started more than two years ago. I always try to encourage people to stick with something, anything, to get practice in both building and breaking a small habit. Because the more reps you get at it, the better you will be. Any habit you're trying to do, break it down to something you can do for just 10 minutes in a day, or a commitment of three times a week. Reward yourself if you need to, but quickly take that reward away as fast as you can. Because if you can find joy in the grind of it, the journey of it, you'll be able to repeat that same process again and again, no matter the destination. Becoming successful in exercising, having a healthy meat vehicle that we all walk around in, or honestly anything else worth doing, takes time. An overnight success isn't something that happens in an instant, though that's the story that's packaged up and sold and commodified. It doesn't actually happen in that easily sold bundle. It happens in thousands of tiny little habits, decisions, and sacrifices that a person made to make that even a possibility. If we subscribe to the overnight, roaring success of mentality, we'll be easily discouraged and be reaching out for more easy fixes. If the fix is a sugary treat, booze, or distracting ourselves away from what we really want to be spending our time on. But in our world, there's no short supply of other options. Therein lies the simple, real effort, though. Because any quick fix is going to become another chronic problem. The solution often becomes the poison. 
So instead, the real short fix and the long-term healing is to start small, keep it simple, and wait for the results. Figuring out what mountains and hills we personally climb is a lifelong pursuit. But we can start somewhere simply and build discipline. With that, dear listeners, it's time for my conversation with Dr. Yusuf Smith, where we talk about how, in my words, difficult it is to be a doctor these days with social media and an information war on the definition of what is to be healthy. We go on musings about how gatekeepers are losing their grip on authority to an algorithm and how people are leveraging that to get into the game. How Yusuf thinks just about everybody is a bodybuilder, we just don't know it. How incredibly difficult it is to hide from sugar in the States with many other things between. Before we end on a short conversation about crypto, which we will actually be revisiting in another episode in this season, with another fellow UK guest and founder of the Web3 company Stay365, who's been on a previous episode as well, in which the three of us have a discussion about all things Web3 and the future. But that's for later. For now, my conversation with Dr. Yusuf Smith, who you can find on the link below in the show notes. Wherever this finds you on our beautiful blue planet, I wish you well. Real quick before the episode begins, if you like what you hear, please tap that follow or subscribe button. You also can find this episode, all episodes in the series, or check out our daily minute podcast by visiting us at bandwidth.productions. All right, cool. Thank you again, Yusuf. Always a pleasure. Um, You need no introduction. If anyone wants to get your introduction, you can go uh, a few episodes ago uh, when we first chatted. Um, So instead, I'm just going to jump right in with another question to kick us off, which is similar to the first one I asked you. um, And that is, what have you done this week that's made you happy? Man, this week, I have finally embraced the joys of being self-employed and not being tied to a specific location. And I went to the library yesterday to do my work. Halfway through the day, I thought, you know what, I'm going to go sit on the grass, do some handstands, carry on work and go home. And it's such a simple pleasure. But for the last three years, I've just been in hospital with no windows and it's quite a miserable place. And just waiting for the time that I can go outside and have a bit more freedom of of location and freedom of time. But I'm a creature of habit and it's so easy to just get stuck in a routine where you're just working at the same desk. And even though like you, there's no constraint, it's that, it's that old adage of the, the elephant that when it was a baby was tied to a pillar. And then as it grows up, it becomes so strong that it could break the rope really easily, but it's so conditioned to being in that zone that it never leaves. Yeah, no, I, I, I fell victim to that trap too, but that sounds quite lovely, being able to go outside and do what you, you want. And I, I think those little like micro moments throughout the day of breaking up the day is something that in especially American culture, we don't recognize. It's only like how you can drug yourself with more caffeine or something along those lines. Yeah, it's not. It's, I, it's grim. How much can you like ramp yourself up? Mm-hmm. But in the UK, we've got to take advantage of the three days of summer that we get. So... <laughs> We're on day two now. <laughs> yeah, well, you know what? I live in the Midwest, and uh, typically, I mean, it's it's definitely like the ecological collapse that's currently happening, where we went from having like a spring that was a cold spring uh, to now all of a sudden it just has flipped to be like, I mean, it's it feels like over 40 degrees Celsius outside. Um, it's brutal. It's like in, in Fahrenheit, it's like 95 degrees with a heat index of over 120. Oh, grim. Yeah, yeah, that is. I also appreciate that you converted to Celsius for, for my sake, I assume. And, and and anyone else that's in the UK listening. It's not, I'm selfishly trying to pander to your listeners a little bit. But uh, I lived in Taiwan for like almost uh, like nine months. Uh, so and even before that, I was studying international relations. Um, and I've learned how useless Fahrenheit is. And I wish that we would. To, <laughs> I, I wish everything but kilometers. I want us to move to 
the, the metric system and everything but kilometers because you know what kilometers just don't make any fucking sense I, I'm, yeah they I, don't I, I, they really don't i mean i Should understand it from UK, like man. the well I, the uk is actually perfect other than your stone yeah. me- unit of measurement which i like because it's like a throwback but yeah so it, it's interesting because when you like I, I noticed this a lot when obviously most men if you ask them what do you weigh they'll give you an, an exact answer but there's a generational divide with patients so if i have a patient who's over 50 i say how much do you weigh they'll give me the answer in stone <laughs> if they're under 50 they'll give it in kilograms um so yeah you have you have to get quite good at converting but yeah the american measurements of like millicups per burger or whatever it's it's completely oh. all over the place dude i hate the ounces i hate ounces oh. like and how ounces is weight and fluid ounces it just none of it makes sense to me <laughs> and I, it just pisses me off quite honestly that's that's refreshing to hear because i um i suppose because you've seen the other side of it have you seen that diagram that's got like it's a pyramid i'm sure we can pull it up for the thing and it's like tons kilograms grams milligrams etc and and all the all the different measurements and then it says like now look at the imperial system and it's just like a shuffle of all sorts yeah yeah everything every unit just this doesn't make any sense to, to like how it builds to the next unit exactly um, yeah no it's 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 frustrating um i don't know i'm a bit of a chameleon where like if something makes sense to me i'll like go all in on it even though it's like quite contrarian i'm not a contrarian well, i just i'm a rationalist you're a seeker of truth and i think that's a much better way to live than being stuck in momentum just because oh that's my religion or that's my culture or you know because you end up missing out on so much beauty and that's why you know i've got family members that my family is Muslim and I've got some family members that have gone quite, they flipped the other way and they've become quite staunch anti or ex-Muslim and they're part of these ex-Muslim forums and they're always um, evangelizing about the, the kind of the opposite side. But I think if you do that, you miss out on so much beauty and wisdom in any tradition. You know, if you're, if you're radically pro or anti with anything um, or if you identify too strongly with something. So I very much resonate with, your dispassionate objective truth-seeking approach it is the, that's actually exactly what it is I, i'm i'm usually quite self-deprecating and cheeky but it really is that I, I i seek truth um but to your point like i was raised catholic and it was always funny to me how the people who were the converts to catholicism were the ones that were like the most like hardcore about everything yeah. um and then it got me to realize that like um and even your example of people who've left a religion ended up becoming quite dogmatic and it's it's as if you're swapping the same program for a different set of variables but it's Absolutely. like you're, you're 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 doing the same pattern you're not actually breaking out of it you're just swapping you know pro with anti but it's the exact same formula it's it's, it's it, literally two heads of the same coin that's a really good way of looking at it that it's swapping the variables of the same function because it's exactly what it is you know you and yeah they're so blind to it <laughs> and it's because mm-hmm. you, know, you take someone who's just generally extreme person and you so it's like on like a video game character you swap out the skin on the yes. on the character but they're still they're still the same still got the same attributes 100 percent, yeah and they can look wildly different um there's a really 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 great book um that actually has there's like a, a handful of books that have had a profound influence on my life and this one is definitely one of them um it's by admin maloff and it's in the name of identity it's in the name of identity and the subtext is violence and the need to belong. And essentially he is from Beirut and then he grew up in Paris, in France. Um, and he talks about identity and he uses it from like the basis because like, you know, the clash of civilizations was very popular back then. There was nine 11, all that kind of stuff when he was writing this and publishing it. And he explains like essentially uh, religious f- fanaticism from the vein of identity and he talks about like yugoslavia as an example and he like you know like how somebody in yugoslavia like over the course of 30 years would like start changing their allegiance of like who they first identify themselves as depending on who they're fighting at the moment Mm -hmm. and then how that blows out into a global world um and then like who the people and then at the ends it with like you know uh an epilogue of who is going to like succeed the most in this new global identity world um and it's quite fascinating and it talks a lot about like what we're talking about which is like you you know like the yugoslavia is a great example where it's like 
depending on what the intercultural friction was of the of the decade is all of a sudden the variables you're swapping for the same function that's very cool i'll have to check that out because there's certain models and like that one that you said the desire for identity is the kind of biggest core desire for for humans and, and personally i think it comes even even above uh security and safety mm -hmm. or control or approval i think identity is the core desire for for people and when you see things through that frame it makes so much stuff make sense suddenly you look at what previously seemed like totally irrational political behavior and you go ah right now i see why they're doing that <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. And in my eyes, where I've landed with it is that I think that the reason I, I completely agree with you. And the reason that I think that is, is because ev evolutionarily, we've been selecting ourselves based off of keeping close tie with other people we identify with because we're tribal and our, our identity, you know, historically, um, or rather historically is a wrong word, evolutionarily has been tribal you you know you stick with your tribes you stick with your identity your identity is not who you are it's who you associate with which is why as Edmund Maloff like brilliantly puts it you know your you define yourself with your identity not what you are but what you're not right so like that's actually building a tribal allegiance um and that's why i think it actually supersedes all of that which once again if we're talking about truth seeking which is why i think like the eastern mysticism starts getting quite fascinating because it's all about how do you dissolve identity as a concept is like one of the core tenets of like Taoism, uh, Buddhism, Hinduism. It's all about your identity is nothing. Dissolve it. Mm. And this can be experientially seen as well. The This iceberg diagram that a lot of people have seen, the classical um, psychology or sort of psychodynamic iceberg of the conscious mind and then below the surface of the water is the unconscious mind and then below that in the deep sea is the collective unconscious right. and then below that is the transcendent is the universe yes. the and, very young yin yes yeah and and that you're able to access deeper and deeper layers of that if you can knock out that um cerebral cortex that kind of sen censoring um filter that we have that's kind of neurotically playing in our in our minds and you know the deeper you go so obviously in sleep it's knocked out so you're in the unconscious and then in deep psychedelic states or in near-death experiences you go into the collective unconscious or, or even deeper exactly yes no 100 percent. yeah and i think it it's that last two layers where it starts getting really fun to me because it's like the collective unconscious you start realizing things where it's like um have i told you my fish and water thing for anyone that is like a regular listener to this show, I'm sorry, but I'm going to keep doing it because I think it's one of the most important ideas that we can have in our time. Um, okay, so there's this author called David Foster Wallace, um, and he is, I, I mean, unquestionably one of the best authors of the past hundred years, like without a doubt. Um, he wrote this really great book called Infinite Jest um, that's like a giant tome if you're reading in an audiobook at several thousand pages, but if you're reading an audiobook, let's just put it in those terms, it's over 52 hours. Um, Ooh, so it's enormous, wow. but it, it's like a farce on the world we're now living in, but it was written 20 plus years ago. And so he like saw it all coming. He was like clearly tapped into it. He has an amazing series of essays though. I always suggest the essays to get people into him because they're short. Um, the, actually he has one that he talks about going to Wimbledon, um, called Roger Federer as a religious experience that like for any athletes or, uh, people who are, um, athletic, Having somebody who is typically so good at writing does not usually mean that they're also athletic, but David Foster Wallace actually grew up as an amateur tennis player. So that golf pro analogy that I have was largely influenced by Roger Federer as a religious experience because the whole time he's explaining how he know he he watches Federer as a religious experience because he knows how good he is because he's so much better than he could ever be, right? So, um, but he has this great speech called This is Water. And it's a commencement speech that I, it's 22 minutes. I listen to it multiple times a year because it's so loaded with things. Um, I suggest anyone to do it, but he opens the speech up with an analogy that I think is incredibly important, um, which is there's two young fish swimming along. When an older fish swims by and says, morning folks, how's the water? And the two young fish go swimming along again. And one goes to the other and says, what the fuck is water? And it's that, those type of things where we take things for completely for granted because we don't think about the fact that we're swimming 
we're just going about our day, right? Similar to like um, your testosterone article, whereas the fact that there's all these things constantly around us, but we're just not taught to think about them, so we don't see them. Um, and I think the collective unconscious is that it's and, and the, the part that gets I most worry about in our time is people who are intentionally manipulating the collective unconscious to say things that are flatly not true. But if you say it over and over and over and over again, it seems like it's true. And you can manipulate the collective unconscious in such a way that you can do in one end atrocities um, and in another end, you can do great things, but you're setting up the next generation for failure. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. I was about to ask you what, what the human equivalent of water is, but I, I agree. I think it's awareness or consciousness and this ability to modulate it is probably, I mean, I'm sure it was possible in the past, but on a very slow scale. Now it's unprecedented. There's so much leverage in the ability to, to do it on a, well, I mean, we talked about this briefly last time where there's possibly a risk of that getting away from us and for AI and yes. al algorithmic um, development to start modifying the collective unconscious without human input. And then we're at the point where we can't even predict or plan what which direction the human mind is going to evolve into. And it's probably not going to be good. <laughs> Personally, I, honest, I think it's already happened. I think we're in a post that world because so like all of these algorithms that social media uses were all developed as marketing algorithms so they're not intended to do anything other than how to keep you on the platform as long as you can which they actually like from emails that have now been disclosed um they actually call it going down the brain stem so the algorithmic writers are intentionally trying to hack your uh what's the brain stem so that you're reacting and they're hitting these dopamine receptors. They're intentionally doing that. So now we're in such a place that like when the New York Times writes an article that is like salacious, they're doing it because they're trying to hit the right things in this algorithm is trying to hit the right things in your brainstem, which to a certain point, and honestly, like how, how much media is influenced by Twitter, I think we're at a point now where we're just causing people to keep reacting in certain ways. Um, and who it's giving us a lot of false positives. I'm like, what actually do people think? What actually is going on? Um, I think it's quite hard. Yeah. And you, you've got to point the cannon in some direction. So my, my business partner, Johnny says in advertising land, cause that's the frame he sees, sees the world in that you've got to put the Facebook pixel somewhere. Right. <laughs> Basically you've got to optimize for something. And the, the fundamental crisis can be averted if we just point the cannon in a slightly different direction but unfortunately as you say what has been pointed at is the brainstem and the kpi is profits which yep. combine those two things and that's a pretty frightening thing to set the sights on totally yeah as opposed to just like user happiness or some other indicator or something like that um yeah it's quite interesting um so I, I did a bunch more uh, research into your site and propane fitness um, that I probably should have done before the first time we talked, but I was quite delighted. So I'm glad I didn't because of the fact that uh, I, I, your ethos and the, what you and Johnny are doing is actually surprisingly to me, um, very in line with the type of like ethics that I have when it comes to working out, you guys go much more into like the bodybuilding kind of side of things than I tend to. I, I grew up as an endurance athlete and I, I, I like to think of myself as trying to become the peak sapien. Um, so there's a huge amount of overlap between what you guys do. And I really appreciate your like natural way of trying to go about it. And most particularly how much you call out everything else that's going on, because just like fish and water, I was actually talking about this with my wife this morning when we were having coffee and she was asking me about our interview that I, we were, we were going to have now. And I said, well, one of the things that I think is most enlightening that he, that you do is call out how much other people are like what they're doing and how it's like, well, yeah, you can get those type of gains, but this is what you're going to end up getting as uh, a result of it. Right. There's, it's not all zero sum game. Right. And I think that's really great. I, I really appreciate that. And you, this kind of comes down to this previous concept of you've got to put the pixel somewhere. So we have to, we assume that our audience are intelligent, self-motivated and Unfortunately, that's not a very sexy thing to, to do because 
the fitness industry, their KPI, what they optimize for is novelty. And that comes about because whoever says it, like the, the, the fitness industry and fitness and media doesn't optimize for truth. It optimizes for engagement and the things that are most engaging are something which is new, even though the principles of gaining muscle and losing fat aren't really going to change anytime soon. But as soon as someone comes out with a crazy new diet or crazy new training protocol or whatever, that gets the limelight. So by definition, the stuff that works is unsexy and boring and <laughs> isn't going to gain massive virality, but we're still sticking to that. Um, now, there's a few other principles in that as well, which are, you know, you, if someone hires a personal trainer, if the incentives aren't aligned properly, the trainer is going to keep doing like muscle confusion training and adding in loads of variety so that the client finds it exciting and, and fun. But that doesn't necessarily get them good results unless there is some kind of hidden progression underneath that and that's a way to trick them into sticking to the program. Our approach is the the gains should be the thing which motivates you because if you stick to a boring program but you start getting into better shape, that's more than entertaining enough rather than doing reverse kettlebell lunges with uh, one week and then doing sort of TRX rows the next week. And, you know, having something which gets you progress that's the entertaining part uh, but yeah i've got I've got loads of stuff to say on that no yeah no, I, mean, I would love to keep unpacking that um and you know like this is here goes to my truth 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 seeking as you put it um i i think that there's a paradox that is in boring and foundational and how it's essential and how if something is like you know like basic has become such like a like a bad word nowadays um like oh that's so basic but it's like, you know what, like, actually, it's that basic boring shit that's the most important because it's the most, like, foundational, the most, like, essential for everything else. And one of the things that I see particularly in the fitness world, um, particularly, so, like, I grew up being a competitive swimmer and doing a lot of endurance athlete stuff, right? And the ethos then, and now that I look at it, what I'm doing now is so completely opposite. And, like, nowadays, like, I'm 32, or about to be 32. And I actually feel stronger and like in better shape now, despite the fact that I'm working out like, you know, when I was like 18, 19, 20, I, I mean, before I started becoming a consultant, I would work out like an hour and a half every day, like rigorously. And now it's like a half an hour to an hour every day, but it's because I'm, and, and I'm warming up and cooling down. You know what I mean? So my rigorous exercise is so much smaller, but I'm doing it in such a more holistic way and not just trying to shove it all into 90 minutes in one block, but spacing it out. You know what I mean? Like I have a warm up, and then I have my main exercise and I have another thing when I'm doing at night to cool down and stretch and all that kind of stuff that is, it, it's not sexy and I, but I'm starting to see it become a little bit more popular. Um, at least in like the scientific side of things. It's great to hear that as well. Cause having targeted effort towards something can get you so much more gains than like just chaos training just throwing everything at the wall binning yourself every session like yeah you're going to make gains doing that but th there is an easier way yeah, <laughs> yeah so yeah. um it's kind of nice to know that like the the, the the problem is and i always struggle with this particularly with podcasts because i don't know who's listening on the other end like there are two sides of that spectrum and they are opposite messages and it's always the person who thinks they need the opposite message that so let me give an example of how intense do you need to train? If I say, do you know what? A lot of people are overdoing it and there's a lot of stuff they can cut out of their training program and have a much more targeted approach and get more gains. If that falls on the wrong ears on someone who's already too lazy with their training, <laughs> they take that as a license to be like, oh, well, I can be really minimal with my, <laughs> with my training. Or you hear the opposite. Someone who's like a really type A driven person is overtraining and just drilling themselves into the ground they're the person who needs that message. But so, and we, we lack the objectivity to be able to tell which one we are a lot of the time. Totally. I think, I think the lesson there is to question everything and listen to people you don't agree with constantly because yeah. that's going to challenge <laughs> what you think, you know, that's true. And the, something else with, with what we recommend and I've got a kind of, controversial view that everybody is a bodybuilder but they just don't label themselves as such what i mean by that is we all want 
more muscle and less fat at the end of the day. We might call it different things. We might have more of a performance goal, but ultimately it's driven by being more muscular, being leaner. Um, we might call it being toned or being more slim or whatever, but, but really those are the variables we're playing with. Yes, not everyone wants to wear a, what do they call it, banana hammock on stage <laughs> and oil themselves yeah. up. But it's that's the same as saying, oh, I want to I want to go for a drive, but I'm scared I might end up in the Formula One or I want to go for a jog, but I don't want to win the 100 meter gold medal sprints. Like it's just, it's not going to happen. It's just further along the same spectrum. Now, this is where things get a bit politically cor- politically incorrect. And I know that you're not shy about about this stuff, so uh, we're in we're in safe <laughs> we're in safe it. space here. But unfortunately, the state of the world is fat phobic, and the studies show that when people look at pictures of leaner people compared to fat people, they ascribe them different personality traits based on looking at those photos. They assign traits of people who are fat in photos as being lazier or less intelligent or less socially adept and the opposite to lean people they associate them being more gregarious richer happier people so there is just an inherent bias in how people see the world i don't agree with it i think it's a shame that that happens but we can't pretend that it doesn't exist so you've got two choices you can either go on a rampage and try and try and fight that um inherent bias that people have and probably fail or you can do yourself a favor get leaner get more muscular improve your your prospects in life improve how people perceive you yes it's a shame that that's the case but the world is only moving more and more image focused Mm -hmm. and so you've got to roll with the punches yeah totally and and the part that to, to that end that gets me most upset nowadays is a complete and utter it's much more worse in the states i would imagine um but a complete and utter acceptance and just like admitting that being overweight is unhealthy and like i i don't believe in shaming people so like i'm not like fat phobic in that sense like i'm not gonna be like you know like you piece of shit you're so fat you're overweight like no that's not you're never gonna hear that out of me but i will tell you like hey man like what's going on with your health like you know are you are you thinking how are you eating are you are you getting active those type of things because you know like and also another thing that you do that i think is amazing um i'm taking a twitter fast and i'm actually thinking i'm not going to come back but uh that i saw you posting a lot on twitter was explaining how there's genetic variations and also like how your lifestyle variations and manipulate your metabolism so like unwinding those things are going to take time so like you know the like the 90s and be- beforehand truism of like oh just like cut everything out of your diet and restrict yourself calorie restrict yourself and it's gonna be all well and good is not actually the case every time um so you know I, I think understanding people's experiences like we talked about last time childhood traumas and things like that or just traumas and how that can go into it understanding that everyone's not starting from the same starting point but ultimately i think we should all have this shared foundational truth which is the more fit you are the more vital, more vitality you have, right? So you, the, the better your days are going to be, right? The better like getting out of bed and walking around doing normal bullshit tasks you're going to feel, let alone, you know, diminishing your chances for some type of catastrophic event. If it's, you know, getting diabetes, having hypertension, any of those number of things are less likely to have. So even saying that has been contentious. It's recently. infuriating. <laughs> Yeah. And luckily, as a clinician, we are kind of insulated from this. Like we have to, obviously, we're compassionate with our patients, but there is a movement of people saying, my doctor fat shamed me or um, I'm refusing consent to be weighed. And so you're like, OK, fine. Like, but let's not let's not pretend. Let's not take the, the additional logical step or illogical step of saying there is no relationship between obesity and medical complications. I did a video recently about uh, there's a GP in the UK who she's branded herself the fat doctor. And this is kind of her claim that there is no um, increased risk of, of harm from being obese. And I think this is a bit of a disingenuous interpretation of the data. Um, she has got some points that about the, the long-term success of kind of dieting compared to lifestyle changes and so on. But we have to accept that obesity 
is a risk factor for multiple downstream multi-system problems and it shouldn't really need much hammering of that of that point but the same way that smoking is not a disease but it absolutely increases your risk of death from a, mul a multitude of other diseases so yeah it, seeing that it what what it is i think the the principle or the what's the the bigger picture of this movement is a kind of a denial of truth or not wanting to look at what's uncomfortable and i think that's really the core of it so yeah the this thing that i posted about um the, the i think the tweet you're referring to was looking at metabolism differences between individuals and i think that within two standard deviations or that like 95 percent of people are within a 600 calorie range of bmi uh, of uh, sorry of bmr so uh basal metabolic rate so that there really isn't much individual variation between metabolisms what there is a difference in is appetite and therefore the amount that you eat that's a bit more of an uncomfortable truth and as a result people kind of turn away from it and say oh no it's because of my metabolism or it's because of xyz listen to the previous episode that we did about the reason for those uh, coping strategies and differences in appetite and food behaviors i'm certainly very compassionate towards the horrific traumas that people have that cause them to to follow those um to, to to have those those coping mechanisms but the cold truth of it is if you track your calories you'll find that you're not broken you don't have a broken metabolism if you measure your thyroid most likely it's normal that's great news that's not I'm, I'm not fat shaming there i'm not saying i'm not trying to take away your excuses i'm trying to say that's that's brilliant you've not got a broken metabolism that means that if we stick to the data and we we track the metrics then we have a stepping stone to improve things with yeah no definitely and, and i think the point that we were making earlier about fish and water is the same about this movement of normalizing obesity in the sense where it's it is altering what is true so that we kind of have a collective unconscious change and what our baseline of normality is so that we can be taught to have a knee-jerk reaction to certain things like saying it's healthier if you're fit and you're not overweight and then you're you know you're, you're trained in this collective unconscious way of thinking like oh man you're an asshole you know <laughs> when the reality of it is is like no that is most certainly the case and i like to bring things back a lot to nutrition because i think sugar is 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 the at par if not worse actually than smoking in some ways because of how habitual it is and you don't think about it and unlike cigarettes where it's like i, I have to seek out that pack of smokes sugar is in everything and it's sneaky in how it's in everything and it especially it, over there oh over here it's terrible yeah and it's like not even yeah. it's not even the, it's not even the organic sugar compound it's corn syrup which actually affects your body differently right mm. so like and it causes more obesity because it's like your body has to go through extra processing in order to actually get that out of it right as opposed to like blueberries is the example i always use like the com the chemical compound of sugar in blueberries is a, is very similar to the chemical compound of glycerin your brain uses so when you eat blueberries that sugar almost immediately goes and gets sent to your brain um where with corn syrup and things like that it's an un it's a processed and unnaturally occurring long sugar chain so it causes your body to go through extra processes to get it, which the result of it is higher fat that you get, you know, metabolizing. There's also just way more than necessary to get the desired flavor. I, like looking at the numbers, when we talked about when I went to New York a few years ago and looking at the data, how most people gain, I'm going to have to find the study, but I think it's eight pounds on average. I might be wrong on that with a trip to the, to the States. But I remember thinking like, whoa, okay, the food quality here is not great in terms of macro composition and the portions are massive so i'm going to need to try and get myself some protein powder to um offset this so i went to the local um shop that i can't remember the the name of it gnc maybe gn yeah that was it and i bought some muscle milk powder which i'd never seen That's before terrible. yeah and like i i got it stupidly i didn't look at the ingredients because i asked the guy like do you have any like whey protein and uh i think i was in a rush when i got back to the hotel i looked at the ingredients mostly sugar yep like a little bit of protein basically it's um 
sh- it's sugar protein water. flavored sugar. Powder. Yeah, it's, it's it's sugar water. Yeah, and and like the thing that blew my mind a few years ago was my wife uncovered how necessary fat is for protein absorption, and how you need you know fat and protein in, in the same sitting for you to actually get the you know advantages out of it. So if you, if you're using like first off. I'll make the bold claim that nothing in a GNC is actually healthy or good for you. Uh, and, you know, most of the things on the market are like that. Like the after much, much research, the protein powder that I use is earth fed muscle because it's grass fed whey. And they like pride themselves on not adding any additives or sugar. They use like stevia uh, and things like that instead of sugar because it is incredibly hard to find anything on the market in the States that's not latent with sugar. And what that ends up doing, you know, on top of everything else in your lifestyle here that makes it hard to sneak sugar and everything is that it changes your appetites. So like, I'm sure people who are listening have had the experience of eating a bunch of pizza and then still feeling like you can eat another pizza. Like part of what is, you know, your body driving you to do that is the fact that it's like, Hey, you just ate a bunch, but it's nothing I could use. So give me something. I need something I could use. Yeah. Interesting. And it's that they think that's one of the mechanisms for why when you have a, a B12 injection that it stimulates appetite, because if it throws the rest of your B vitamins out of out of proportion oh. and your, your body goes, ah, OK, so I, I need to rebalance them. I don't know if that's um, I, I don't know if there's evidence behind that. But th- the other thing you know, is that you add crazy flavors to stuff and loads of salt, and loads of sugar. And, and we talked about parfum and parabens and stuff last time, too it gets to the point where it's gratuitous and it's beyond what's necessary to get a good taste. And if you go off, if you try and avoid sugar or if you go abroad and you just, you're just having like whole foods for a few weeks, come back and you have a sip of Coke and you're like, Oh God, that's like syrup. It tastes wrong, but we're just so accustomed to it. I I'm dieting at the moment and I'm nailing the diet Coke, but I dilute it by 50%. And even that tastes like quite a strong flavored drink. And I think it's just because you we're so used to really concentrated stuff with, I guess, brands are in an arms race to make something more and more powerfully flavored. And um, But the same thing goes for cosmetics and perfumed products. And I was on a podcast recently about estrogen and the, the impacts of environmental estrogens. And like pine and apple scented washing up liquid for your dishes why do you need scented dishes unbelievable no uh, this is like a huge passion area of mine which is why I'm, I'm so happy that you touched upon it last time we talked and send me that podcast link by the way i'd love to listen to that Will do. um because it is an arms race it's like the because people aren't educated into what it all is i feel like we've unknowingly got us into a situation where we're swimming in poisoned water and if we first jumped in and didn't experience it, we would be shocked and not be able to handle it. But because it's like, it's like, it's like becoming an alcoholic where you like can go out drinking and drink like 10 shots in a night. Right. But if you go do that again, after taking six months off and you try taking two shots and you're like, I'm fucked right now. Like, how was oh, I doing yeah. that? Like if you had loads of alcoholic friends and then you went off abroad and came back and tried to just slip back in to the drinking routine, it would probably kill you, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, seriously, I don't drink anymore. Like, I'll have a beer every once in a while, but, like, I think now, back now, of, like, how much I was drinking, and I was just like, what was I doing? How could I have done that? Like, what? <laughs> like, I was drinking how many of these IPAs a night? Like, I have one, and I'm blitzed. Like, what? I, so, I, I don't know much about American drinking culture, but there's definitely a sense of bravado in the UK about it, of, like, how, how much you can handle, and if you're a heavyweight, and, and it's it's a weird thing to be prideful about, I think, but yeah. it is what it is. It's not as quite ubiquitous as it is in the UK, that type of drinking culture. It's much more around like bros in the States. But the thing with the States be is that our, how pervasive alcoholism is, is not talked about. Like coming home and having a glass of wine every night, like, uh, is that okay? How much, you, how many, how often are you doing that? Like, we don't mm-hmm. talk about that, let alone the fact that what is probably the most norm is people just getting fucked up every weekend and not, like, questioning, like, you know, going out and getting hammered and then being hung over one day of your week every week is, what is that actually doing to you? I'm interested that you don't drink because I think I'm biased and I'm blind to the fact that there's maybe a middle ground with alcohol, but 
I was brought up Muslim, never really drunk when I was younger. Tried it a few years ago, was a bit underwhelmed by it all. And also the, the hangover in the next day, I was like, God, this is really unpleasant relative to the, the, the upside of the actual effect. Why do people do this? So I think I'm biased because like, I, I feel like I'm not getting, I'm not getting it. Like there's a part of that's just not clicked for me. And I'd love to, it, maybe it's just the addictive potential, but I'd love to know a bit more about what caused you to stop drinking and where, wow. where you are on this kind of spectrum now. Oh, okay. Uh, this is okay. So let me set the stage with this. Um, there was never a sense in my house growing up that alcohol was bad. So like, but it was my parent. I've never seen my parents drunk. I've never seen any of my fam- my like extended family members drunk actually. But like when we would have like Easter or Christmas, like, I mean, I think I might've been like eight maybe where like my grandmother gave me a glass of wine at Christmas and she like watered it down and put ice in it. Right. So like I had like maybe like a third of a glass of wine over the course of whole dinner. Right. Um, so, but that was kind of the way that I was brought up. So like, um, I don't agree with my parents did with this sense, but they got me drunk when I was like 13 or 14. Um, really, uh, (laughs) stupidly, they said they did it just so they could see how I was acting so that if I came home drunk, they would know I was drunk, which is just bad parenting. Um, but, uh, it's a strange rationale, but they, there's a lot of things like that latent with my parents. Um, but, uh, what it ended up doing was when I went to all these type of different things, I'm just kind of highlighting and glossing over a lot. When I went to college and I saw people binge drink for the first binge drink for the first time. Um, and I would already, I was already drinking a lot in, in high school at this point, like going to parties. I, I played a lot of music. So, you know, I'd be like playing music in you know, whatever someone's garage and just getting a little drunk. Um, it's, but I never saw people binge drink like that and like get, getting so drunk that they're like pissing themselves and stuff. And it was so strange for me because of growing up in this, in this sense of like, I wasn't around very many alcoholics. Um, I didn't, I wasn't really around people that would drink any, any time outside of holidays and things like that. And then like when you're a musician, like, you know, and you're hanging out and you're all getting drunk, like you're just kind of like steady buzzed the whole time. <laughs> you're not like vomiting and that type of stuff. At least that wasn't the culture of the people I was hanging out with. So that was quite shocking um, to see. However, the like the rolling ball of going to college in the States and like this party atmosphere, I was in a fraternity, like those type of things, like just kind of rolled and rolled and rolled and rolled to the point where I wasn't even thinking of the fact of like how drunk I was getting, like how frequently I was getting it, right? Um, but because of a lot of things of like growing up and personality traits, I definitely started forging a really bad relationship with alcohol. Um, and I, I definitely think that I was quite addicted to it. And especially not addicted to the sense that most people talk about it, where it's like, I have to go home and get a drink. But in the sense of like every weekend, I felt like I needed to go out and blow off some steam, quote unquote, blow off some steam, right? And it was at the moment where my consulting career was really starting to take off. And I, w- I landed like a really awesome client. I was like leading this project of like 50 people. Um, and the other thing in consulting that people don't talk about a lot is that alcoholism is rampant. Um, I'm being very flippant with using the word alcoholism because I think it is, which is controversial. But like your company will reward you for a good job by paying for all the drinks when you guys are going mm-hmm. out for dinner, right? Or you're going out with a client and the client's going to get sauced because you're paying for the, the meal. And there's a peer pressure of you're going to get sauced too because then you form this like fucked up bond with the client in which sense that they're going to be like more likely to continue your contract, more likely to tell you what's going on, all those type of things. So there's like, that is pervasive. And I was seeing that and I was like, Oh, whatever. Like I'm a fraternity boy though. Like I could totally keep up with this. And I almost saw it as like a competitive advantage towards my peers because I was already immersed in that type of culture and lifestyle that switching it to this corporate high stakes game just kind of seemed like fun to me. But through riding that wave to the top, I started realizing, um, well, first off, like my, my personal goals, like I'm probably the most ambitious person I know. So like my goals are never like, I landed this awesome contract. How can I ride this to like the next stage of my career in the company? I'm always thinking, how do I go work for myself and become ridiculously wealthy? Like that's my goal. Right. Mm -hmm. So I started realizing like, Hey, like I'm traveling five days a week when I'm traveling, I'm working 10 hour, 10, 12 hour days for the client and all of my time to build towards what I want, which is my own company. I do on the weekends and I started realizing I was like, I cannot dedicate one day of the week to being hungover 
I can't dedicate two days of the week to being so hungover. expensive. If that's the if that's the North Star goal, then time wise, very expensive. I couldn't do it anymore, right? So because of my ambition, it got me to readjust what I'm doing and how I'm spending my days. So my the first thing that I did was I said, okay, I'm going to build guardrails. Um, unless I'm going to be planning on going out and staying out and going to a rave. Um, or something like that, I'm going to be out until sunrise, I'm going to be home and in bed before midnight. And I'm not going to drink <clears throat> more than one drink, period. There's no longer any more than one drink. And even if I'm going to rave, I'm not drinking more than one drink. That's it. And then through the course of time of doing that, I started realizing, oh, shit, I got a problem with alcohol. Like, oh, shit, this is actually really not normal. Oh, shit, I see where this is all coming from. And through the course of doing that, I just decided I'm not going back. Like, I don't, I don't think I should go back. So now I went through a long time of like turning down a beer or a glass of wine every single chance. Um, and now I'll have a, a beer with a burger every once in a while, or like, you know, like a, once a week I'll have a beer or something like that. Just cause I do like to taste it's delicious. Um, I like, like, you know, I like coffee a lot, which is a problem. That's like my biggest addiction I'm trying to break right now. Uh, but it's a complicated taste structure. There's a different variety in it. Um, but I still do notice if I slip, I'll want to have two beers and then I'll want to have five. So it's still there, but I'm mm. building guardrails. That's interesting. I mean, hearing your journey of alcohol, you've been th- through both ends of extreme consumption and extreme abstinence. And now you've settled at a, a kind of sustainable mm-hmm. rate. That's the, the classic journey of going through an addiction and then seeing the other side of it and being like, whoa, okay, I see the harm that it's causing and then ending up at a happy medium and having a healthy relationship with it, which is awesome. Um, I feel like because it's always just been at a zero for me, you know, with a couple of like tests, <laughs> um, that I've not been able to develop a, a a real feel for 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 what it is. And so to me, it's still a bit of an unknown. I'm still not clear why people do it, but that explanation makes a lot of sense. And I think um, this idea of it being a corporate tool almost to lubricate clients and, and consultants makes sense. I do wonder what problem are they solving? Like from on a human perspective, like what problem is alcohol solving? Lubricant, social lubricant. I I, I think that, I think our Western society um, has made a brand of itself of shedding everything that's ever come before. So our cultural norms are fucked. So we need something to lower our inhibitions to do it. So I'll also tell you something else. So like I, some part of my disposition, definitely because of childhood trauma, I don't feel inhibition like normal people do. And I'm acutely aware of it to the point where I have to more often than not like governor myself. So like when I go, when I start Mm. drinking, I actually, it was pointed out to me that I'm not a different person when I'm drunk. And I actually realized how dangerous that was. So actually the first time I got a sign that I had a problem with alcohol is I was with my college girlfriend and some guy came up to us at a party and like talked to me for 10 minutes and was like raving about this conversation we had and how much I influenced like his thought and he's like changing his, getting his life together and like all these things. And this guy leaves and my girlfriend at the time goes to me and she's like, who was that guy? And why did you talk to him? And I was like, I'm gonna be honest with you, I have no fucking idea. And it took me like a week to find out that I talked to this guy at a party and I was pissed drunk, blacked out, but I had no idea of it because I don't like, I don't have inhibitions normally. So like often when someone says something, I I have to run through my head, like what's the soft way that I can say what I want to brutally say, um, and, and have to work at it that way. So I think interesting, the social lubricant is it lowers people's inhibitions because we culturally don't have a mechanism of talking to each other. Like the ancient Greeks, the ancient Greeks are the best example of this where they talk a lot about hospitality, but hospitality was an ancient concept and it transcended the culture you were in and the sense of if we are meeting each other, there's actually like a cultural ritual of how we interact and that has completely gone away. We don't have any shared sense of being able to talk to each other in the way that we have. Um, Okay. Especially in the way that we do. I think it's a lost skill. Yeah, and like, okay, so you and I, We don't know each other very well, but we talk as if we do. And that's because we have all of these, and this is, this goes back to the fish and water. And part of what I try to do is point out the obvious, which is actually you and I are quite trained in the art of conversation, but that's a, that's a a, a thing that isn't talked about. So it does, it doesn't exist. 
So you have these weird corporate structures where, you know, p- people are having conversations and they're just throwing words around and it sounds stupid, but because it's in this like corporate <laughs> vein, it's normal. And the second you go out and you're starting to have a dinner and you're trying to connect each other on a person by person level, we don't have the means of knowing how to do that. So having alcohol to lower inhibitions is, is the lubricant to do that. I see. So it's a short term solution to a long term um, problem or some, or really a, a lost, lost art or a lost skill that humans at some stage were better at. I believe so. Yeah. And I think that your truism of what you said, it's a short term solution for a long term problem is also a truism for most Western culture at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> Very true. So what is your general ethos around exercising? I love your idea of everyone's a bodybuilder because I I actually completely subscribe to that too. Once again, I think everyone should try to be their peak self. Um, And I think part of that is physical and part of it's mental. Um, So what is your kind of ethos? Because once again, you talk a lot about meditation and mindfulness too, which I appreciate. Yeah. So it's a cliche, but this thing of it's a shame for man to live his life without experiencing the the potential that his body can, can experience. But the thing that attracted me to lifting was, or to and lifting and gymnastics is that to be able to do something that last week you physically weren't able to do, like that's really cool. That's, that's awesome. Like, and whatever shape that takes, whether it's endurance athlete, like you can run a certain distance in a time that you never, you couldn't do before, or you can do a backflip that you weren't able to do, or you can lift more weight, whatever it is. I don't really mind the um, and I'm, you know, my preference is just my value judgment of how that expresses itself. But I do think lifting weights is a very high ROI thing to do because for the first two years of lifting weights, you get probably 80% of the progress that you're ever going to get. Um, and then it's up to you after two years, whether you want to like spend the next 10 years squeezing out every last like 10 grams of muscle on your frame, or you want to switch gear, but everyone could do with just two years of basic barbell lifting. I think it just does wonders for how you feel in your body, your bone density, your life length, your cardiovascular fitness. Like there's so many kind of downstream benefits that you get from lifting. And when I have patients that express an interest in this, as well as clients, well, I mean, clients are different because clients are already problem aware, solution aware, self-motivated. So whereas patients might be like, I want to improve my health, but I'm kind of don't know where to start. For them, I just say, keep it simple. You know, some horizontal pressing, some vertical pressing and some horizontal pulling and vertical pulling and then do a legs exercise and just do that three times a week in whatever way you want to. For the, for those populations, I'm not going to be dogmatic about, oh, you ha- it has to be barbells or dumbbells or machines or whatever. Like just what, whatever works, whatever you can do pain-free, celebrate your body, find success in the movement. And then if you want to take things more more seriously, you can if someone's listening and they're like, okay, none of this woo-woo stuff, you said, just tell me what's the most efficient, optimal way to get there. Fine. In that case, do a five by five barbell program with linear progression until you can't progress anymore. That is two years of progress sorted. At the end of two years, then you might need to start making some modifications. But I just wish someone told me that when I was 16, 17, you know, Yusuf, I want you to go in that bunker and lift five by five, add 2.5 kilos a week. Don't do any fancy stuff. Don't try and get clever with it and just eat a mild surplus. Do that for eight years and come back to me. I would have been in far better shape, but instead I drank the Kool-Aid of the fitness industry and tried to program hop and always look for the, the new hack and the new thing and, and the magic pill at the back of my mind, I kind of knew that there probably isn't one, but I was always looking for the shortcuts. Um, so yeah, I just hope I can save at least one person <laughs> the the pain of that and stick to the boring basics, eat a mild surplus and don't get injured. That's the other big one. You know, it's kind of, again, very granddad advice, but don't get injured because if you do, that fucks your progress more than anything else. <laughs> yeah, totally. I actually, I, I have devised a workout program for myself and I actually am coming back from tearing my shoulder a year ago and I'm actually now able to like really put into place, um, w- this new uh, workout program that I've been kind of like building for myself. And I have said that to my wife, probably to the point of annoying her of being like, man, like 
when I was in high school and I was swimming like crazy, like I wish somebody was telling me like how to do it, how I'm doing now, because it seems so simple. Right. But it wasn't, it wasn't what was once again, like fish and water, not to keep bringing that up. It wasn't what was thought of as normal back then. Right. And like normal back then for, you know, my type of thing and my type of sport back then, which was swimming. Um, now I'm going to like, once I get a bike, I'm going to get into triathlons again. That's what I'm kind of shooting for. But, um, you know, back then it was like, if you're, and literally my coach would do exercises with us where we would do sprints in the pool and we wouldn't stop until someone threw up. And he had a oh. distinction of somebody throwing up to get out of the exercise to being real throw up. So sometimes it was like the first time somebody threw up on account Cause he was just like, you just drank too much water and you're trying to get out of this for everybody. Keep going. The guy sounds abusive. Oh, it was a lot of abuse. No, totally. Yeah. I won't Good say his name, me. but it was, he was a good person, but he was wrapped up into this mindset because that is pervasive. <laughs> to make a distinction between, oh no, that's a fake vomit. And that's a real one. Goodness me. But see, like that is, that's, that was swimming though. So like swimming, like that wasn't just my team that was like that. That was everybody <sighs> was like that across the thing. And it's to the point where if, am I willing to, um, and like this, the, the program I was in was we were like a small amount of people. I think we were like around 30, but we were like competing at the top levels of state every year. So like, is he willing to gamble and say, I'm going to do something differently than everybody else? Right. So like, I, I try to look at it from his perspective. So was he being abusive? 100%. But that was also like considered normal. We're like the name of the game. Right. Yeah. Where like now I think about it so much more where it's like, I wish somebody would have just said, which is why whenever I meet younger people every, all the time, I'm always trying to like push this. I'm trying to find the right balance of spark of the inspiration in them. But basic. It's interesting. And also the last thing I want to, I want to touch on, sure, and I would love to hear your thoughts, is that you said two years. Like that is missing in almost every single fitness program and every single like lifestyle adjustment that I see out there. It's how can I get you something now? as opposed to saying like, how can we make you feel better every single day? But the goal that we're trying to reach is two years out, which I think is incredibly important. Again, unfortunately, it's not, it's not sexy. It's probably why we haven't gone viral because we're not making claims Let's make in it 28 sexy. days. Yeah. But, <laughs> but yeah, like this is, that's the real life hack because that time's going to pass anyway. So why not in two years time, you'd be jacked and lean I, I recently decided to take YouTube more seriously and I joined a mentorship program for it. And basically the guy's advice was like, I'm going to cover all the different elements of thumbnail design and, uh, you know, jump cuts and editing and titles and headlines and topic selection, all that stuff. But really, if you just upload a video every week for two years and try and make them a bit better each time, that's how you grow a YouTube channel. And the rest of the stuff I'm going to teach, like, yeah, you improve your chances of it, but there's no way around just uploading once a week for two years. And hearing that, it's like, oh, that's actually really relaxing to know because I'm prepared to do that work and I'm prepared to kind of optimize it. I'd be, I'd kind of be more annoyed if there was a special hack because then <laughs> as soon as someone finds the hack, Game over. then it's leveled the, you know, you, you, no one's able to grow a channel anymore. Um, so yeah, I think the, the real, um, thing is like fully making peace with the fact that something is going to take a while, learn to enjoy the process, learn to not get injured in the process, which I guess could take in business perspective, business form could make, take the form of uh, bankruptcy mm -hmm. or getting sued or something. Um, and just run the program. Yeah. The, the phrase I like a lot, which applies to both business and life is, um, what you don't see in an overnight success is 10 years of effort. And a great uh, example of this is Nanantic, uh, Nanantic, Nanantic, something like that. It's the people who made Pokemon Go. So the guy who made Pokemon Go and all of a sudden was an overnight success. What you don't see is that, yeah, Pokemon Go was an overnight success, but that guy actually failed at a previous um, attempt at the same app, but it was for like interesting places as opposed to catching Pokemon. So uh. that was one failure. But even before that, he left Google and he actually did Google Maps. Like he's one of the main people who architected Google Maps that then wow. left to go start an antic who failed at this first augmented reality and then hit huge on Pokemon Go. So what you don't see is the fact that this person was putting in that incremental effort again and again and again and again and again. Because like what, what did um, Einstein said the eighth wonder of the world is compound interest. And it's exactly what we're talking about here. 
where if I'm just doubling down my effort and I'm building upon the effort I had yesterday and putting a little bit more effort in today because I can, right? Like people sometimes they, like I have a good friend of mine, Dan, and he says to me all the time, he's like, dude, I don't know how you're able to do so much in a day. He's like, I'm always blown away by how, how many things you're doing. And the reality of it is, is dude, I got here because I just did a little bit more every single day. And like, you know, like I know that I could build a habit if I just build one more thing next, then I can incorporate that into everything else I'm doing. And then before you know it, I'm doing, you know, multiple different things throughout my day, but I've just built a little bit day by day by day by day. And if it's whatever goals you're trying to achieve or just trying to be more fit, that's the sustainable way of doing it. Why isn't that celebrated more? Because culture's people... lost. What's that? Our culture's lost. Culture's think... Yeah, like people see someone who's been madly successful and they, you know, the perception is, oh, well, they just ran up. They took one swing at it and that's it. They smashed it. And they don't see all the previous attempts. And, you know, yes, there are people who get lucky, but you can't replicate that anyway. So you've got someone like this Pokemon Go guy. I didn't know that story. It makes a lot of sense. It's really cool to to see that. There was a study of splitting kids into two groups and making them do pottery. And they said to one group, you're going to be graded on quality. So you need to produce one really good piece of pottery. And then the other group, they said, you'll be graded on quantity. So just produce as many as you can. doesn't matter if they're shit, just make them. <laughs> that group produced better quality by the end of the testing point huh. because they just got so much practice. They just did so many reps. It's like, oh yeah, well, it just totally makes sense. But instead we're sat here being perfectionists and trying to craft this like one perfect thing in, in the dark with no, so with no, no outward feedback and thinking we're going to somehow make the perfect thing. Whereas, whereas actually if you just do loads of rubbish, <laughs> eventually it's going to have to get good. That's, that's fascinating. And it also makes a lot of sense. Um, I was talking with somebody who's like just starting their career, um, in consulting recently. And he was telling me he was thinking about going back to school for like something entrepreneurship and things like that. And I was like, Hey man, I'm going to challenge your thought really quick before you do that. Think about how you can get more reps in. So like, can you join startups where you're volunteering? Can you, you know, what, what can you just do it? Can you practice building something? Can you just go out there and get the reps in? Cause going to school is one way of doing it, but it's not, the right way if you ask me the right way is if you want to get better at doing pull-ups figure out ways that you can do pull-ups right like do you do you need a weight assist right do you do you need to do it a different do you move your hands in a different way like what what can you do to just start doing it as fast as you can because it's actually in the process of doing what you're trying to do that you'll achieve something not in the process of trying to achieve it in the first go yeah the quote of fear not the man who's practiced a thousand kicks but the guy who's practiced one kick a thousand times. Again, a bit of a cliche, but I think sometimes these cliches are, are, are so true and they become cliche for a reason. But I feel it. There's always an in, in, internal sense of like, oh yeah, I know that, and kind of discounting it in our minds. Whereas no, like we need to sit and look at that. It's an uncomfortable truth. And because it's uncomfortable, we kind of, we we just always have this desire to look for the the sugary magic pill. <laughs> yeah, I think part of that is our evolution, and I think the majority of it though is our our culture is that we kind of have praised that. I actually think a lot of it this gets a little tinfoil hatty has to do with uh, gatekeepers. I think like gatekeepers want to push the idea that this person out of nowhere hit big became a thing, because then that puts them in the control of picking the winners. And pushing that narrative mm. as opposed to the world that we're in now, which is like, if you look, do you know about Mr. Beast? Yeah. Okay. So Mr. Beast became popular because of what we're talking about, not a gatekeeper. Right. And he's very flippant about talking about the fact that he's like, no, I just put in all the hours, man. And, <laughs> I, and this is the way that I did it. Right. And I did it every day. I just did it every day and I got better. Um, and I think that we're in a point now where the gatekeepers have comp are losing control. So I think that they want to push more this overnight success as much as they can, because that's in their best interests of being able to pick the winners. It's amazing seeing Mr. Beast talk about this because he's young. He's like 22 or something yeah. running an empire. And mm -hmm. it's purely, as you say, he just turned up and did reps. And it's, I love seeing that in action with YouTube. So there's another guy called Mr. Who's the boss, very similar, like big YouTube channel does mm -hmm. kind of tech reviews 
And if you look back on his old videos from 10 years ago, they are terrible. <laughs> like they're, they're actually worse than say mine were when starting out. And I thought mine were really bad. And so you're like, oh, wow, like this guy isn't immensely talented. He didn't just hit the ground running like this. But we just assume that's the case. We see a really well-produced studio and we go, whoa, like this guy's a natural. No, he's not. He just did shitty tech reviews for for years and got amazing. So it's it's lovely when there's a track record and you can actually just scroll back on YouTube and see it. And it's like, oh, well, there's no secret. You just need to go and do the work. Tell me more about the gatekeepers. Mm. What do you want to know? So you said that the the gatekeepers are at the root of uh, perpetuating this myth that there is kind of a shooting to stardom without putting in the work. I think so. I I think that it's... uh, Okay, so this goes back to like a lot of the things I think about, which is like scale and complexity. So like I'm a big proponent of complexity theory. Um, And I think I'm a big proponent of... the science of scaling as well. So I think when you get to the point where you're at now, um, okay, I'll give you one music. Music is an, is an easy one to do. Like mm. if you were, okay, Nirvana comes out of nowhere, right? Nirvana blows up and no one thought that's like the Seattle grunge rock was going to be anything. Right. But they hit. So then what happened? The music executives went out and they looked for other people that looked and sounded like them. And they just started mm. pushing them. And then, like, seeing if it would work. The Beatles put in their hours going in Hamburg, playing in a brothel. That's that's how the Beatles became good, is they played seven shows a day in a brothel in Hamburg, Germany, for, like, <laughs> multiple years. And then they came back to the UK with all these refined way of playing with each other, right? Like, I think, um, I personally think that uh, um, John Lennon and uh, Paul McCartney are, like, amazingly talented people. But it's the four of them playing together that was the, the secret sauce, right? And they got there by playing over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. Well, what did the music executives do? They came up with the monkeys. The monkeys were legitimately a, bun- a, a studio executive saying, how can we make a band that looks like the Beatles? And they just put it together, right? So, like, I think that that's been there. And I think nowadays it's almost like the last dying grasp of that model, right? Because you see people who are able to blow up because they put in the work themselves to build a brand, to build, you know, a followership, to maybe have a podcast. Um, someone that I hope to get on here is this musician called Andy Frasco. I think he's an interesting example of this, where he just like hit the road and did t- over 200 shows a year for 10 years. Went on the musical music festival circuit, started getting a, a group of people, you know, with that. He has a podcast. He's doing it himself, as opposed to, you know, I don't know, no shade at Dua Lipa, but Dua Lipa, you know, isn't even writing her stuff. She's just an image and they paid for really good music production uh, of somebody that you don't even know. That's the one that's making Mm. all the beats that all of a sudden, like you get the drop that get you really excited. Right. That's a really good analogy. So yeah, you've got Dua Lipa who I kind of see as a a product. She's like a, she is, you know, she's she's like a a bottle of shampoo or something. She's just been a creation of corporate selection. And I guess what you're saying there is with the Nirvana example that, something comes out which is a bit of an anomaly and then instantly that generates an echo of like right we need to really milk that and keep keep pumping out new versions of that until it's no longer roi positive and then we switch to the next thing so it's like an echo effect every time something genuine comes out the profit seeking machines jump on it and rinse it for all it's worth and then the next thing moves on and it you know we're seeing it at the moment like this morning I feel like I, I feel like I, I damaged my, my own soul doing this, like I <laughs> nauseatingly editing a video, like a short clip for TikTok in the style of the kind of um, influences in our niche now, like with a s- specific font, you know, that big kind of bold mm-hmm. font with the different colors and the emojis and horrible, <laughs> aesthetically disgusting. And I hated every moment that I, that I did it, but and it's kind of the game that you have to play with algorithms. Yes. It gets hairy when you start getting into the algorithms because they are selecting for a certain thing. And then you have like TikTok, which is a Chinese state run algorithm <laughs> that's trying to do certain things to destroy the West. So yeah, it's, it's, that's when it starts getting even hairier. Cause now we have an algorithm as a gatekeeper where before, before the gatekeeper used to be white dudes 
in suits that were secretly raping everybody. And now it's an algorithm. <laughs> God. Well, yeah, at least like humans, no matter how abhorrent they are, have some re- faculty of reasoning. Whereas the risk of a, an algorithm that just goes, yeah, it's, it's then optimizing down the brainstem, as you say. We have reason until we are intentionally blinding ourselves to it. Yeah. So, okay. So with your clients and your kind of ethos of fitness, it's first, let's, let's explain to you what a foundation is. Let's set your expectations of where you're going to be two years down the line. What do you do next? So then it's just, right. How do I pick the, how do I make it as easy as possible to, to turn up and do that? So how do I make the good habits as easy as possible and the bad habits as hard as possible? Some people naturally have a low appetite and struggle to gain weight. I think they're kind of in the minority nowadays, but I was one of them. Other people naturally will overeat. If you're left to your own devices, you eat a surplus. So then it's like, okay, diet wise, how do we make it so that effort isn't required every day to hit my calorie target? Well, what I would do is if I naturally overeat, I would throw out all of the Oreos in my house and all the stuff that's easy to just hammer and get some fruit, get some some high volume foods. Um, look at the satiety index if you're interested in this stuff. Like it's basically someone did a study where they, they ranked all of the popular or common foods according to how many calories do you eat subsequently after eating 100 calories of this food? So, for example, if you ate 100 calories of toast, you might go on to eat X number of calories the rest of the day. If you ate 100 calories of chips or a croissant or something like that, you'd go on to eat more calories. And so then it was ranked based on... And so the on the spectrum, I think um, like pastries and chips and things or, or crisps are on the the lowest end of the satiety index and boiled potato is on the highest end. So per 100 calories or per 100 grams of boiled potato, you're likely to eat less less food um, going forward. So pick high satiety value foods. Um, cauliflower is a, is a big one as well. You can make cauliflower rice, you can just bulk out foods, make big salads. Um, overall principle is align your behaviors with your desired outcome. Same with training. Pick movements that you enjoy. People are dogmatic about, oh, you have to deadlift or you have to squat or whatever. If it causes you pain or if you don't like the movement, then pick something that you do enjoy. Just make sure that you're not doing six biceps exercises. You know, you're, the, the goal is as long as you have some kind of hip hinge movement and some quad dominant movement for your legs, I don't care if it's a front squat, a back squat, a split squat, a hack squat, leg press, whatever, just something to to get the work in and then set the program, run it, just have it running in the background. You don't want a diet or a training program to be so difficult that you're aware every day of your life that you're doing it because that's the quickest way to fall off the wagon. You know, people argue, especially on Twitter about keto and, or about carnivore or intermittent fasting or what any of these kind of diet protocols as being the superior thing whereas i think let's ignore the physiology for a moment and just look at it behaviorally if someone said to you you are not allowed to eat any carbohydrates you have to only eat meat as soon as you go to a restaurant you, you're screwed because you you can't control what's what's on the menu you fall off the diet or it becomes socially difficult or whatever so 10 weeks of that feels like hell Compared to if someone said, you know what, you can eat whatever you want, as long as it's within your calorie targets, just be flexible. You probably barely notice that you're on a diet. Now, matching those calories, I mean, in in truth, you would act, you'd lose the same amount of weight pretty much over that time. But let's assume for a thought experiment that keto is so efficient that it's 20% better for fat loss, which would be a you know, massive advantage, 20% better. Okay, so what what is that in real life? That means that a 12-week diet that isn't on keto, where you're eating the foods that you enjoy and not really noticing that you're dieting, if you're eating keto, it takes nine weeks. Okay, big deal. Like, it's not a it's not a game changer, but for those nine weeks, it's it's hell. So, 
I just think like make it easy for yourself. I love that. That's amazing. I, I, I particularly, I, all of that, I, I, I really appreciate your, your ethos, which is like, make it easy on yourself. The way that I think about things and the, the language I use for the same end is reduce friction. Like what's the yep. way that you can reduce the most amount of friction so that you will do something? Is it as picking a time of day to do it, right? Like when you feel most energized, is it, you know, like you, incorporating foods that you like, is it substituting foods that are similar to what you like, but more healthy, right? Or is it, you know, pairing things like, you know, I like doing, you know, I always feel great when I'm in this state. So when I, you know, I'll delay the gratification of doing that until I get this in, you know, like whatever you could do to like reduce the friction to get yourself to do it because to bring back Sisyphus, right? Like get used to rolling the ball and that's what you need to do if, in, in any way of doing that is, is the best if it's not, you know, altering things too fast and making it brutal on yourself, picking the right exercises or any of that. Yeah. And there's a kind of bravado that people have. I, I, I had it early on of trying to pick the optimal thing and ignoring the fact that it's totally impractical with my life setup. <laughs> I have to do this particular glute ham raise exercise, but the only the only gym in my area that has that machine is thirty five miles away, and I'm gonna right, so I'm gonna have to drive there every day. Like, okay, fine. The glute ham raise might be a more optimal program selection uh, exercise selection for that particular goal or whatever, but at what cost? Like, probably at the cost that you're not gonna make it to the gym two times out of every 10 because you you finish work late and the gym closes and you can't get there in time so like it's cutting off your nose to spite your face um or there's just a sense of like well i shouldn't have to infantilize myself and um make things easy and do the james clear kind of paint by numbers stuff but actually you do i think like the times when I've stopped trying to be so clever and just treated myself like a child are the times when I've made the most progress. Oh, that's true. I think, I think that's a truism. The only, the only caveat I have to this is that I think everyone should do Turkish get-ups. They suck. I, put, <laughs> I, I, I hated them so much and now I've grown to really, really like them. Um, I just think it's an amazing complicated movement that has hits everything. And like, I've never had an exercise that, exhaust okay i don't want to say exhaust me it gets my heart pumping in such a way that afterwards i feel not only cardiovascularly worked out but like i just feel like a fucking beast it's a cool trick to be able to do it with a human as well so if, if anyone's listening that has kids you know start with your baby perfect progressive overload as they get heavier <laughs> and heavier keep doing turkish get-ups with them i've i've once done it with a an adult woman but she was small she, she must have only weighed like 45 50 kilos um, but you can get them to just curl up in a ball, holding their own elbows, and then you get your hand inside, holding the inside crease of their elbow, and then you can just about um, do a Turkish get-up with them. Oh, Quite shit. Cool okay, so trick. that's my goal, is to be able to do it with my wife now? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, if you can. Uh, not right but, now, but uh, I think I can, eventually. Nice. Yeah, I'm at, yeah uh, I mean, the, the, the only problem is, like, you've got to you've got to put the Facebook pixel somewhere, and if you're optimizing for that, then either you've got to get mad strong or she's got to get mad light and um so you you got to find the the sweet spot <laughs> she's already the, at the light end so now i just need to get uh, mad strong fine. yeah <laughs> i am actually this is like a a, a point of, of happiness for me is that i've now recovered my shoulder to the point where i'm actually starting to use pretty heavy kettlebells i'm at like a 20 a little bit less that would that probably be like 18 kilograms um oh, kettlebell th- it's 35 pounds so that would probably be like what 18 kilos somewhere around there yeah um so uh yeah which is for me is awesome because that's it's also a, such a complicated movement um you, the thing that i've noticed most in this new type of exercise routine that i have is forget all of the bravado about numbers on plates because it's doing what you can do with those numbers that actually matters and one exercise like turkish get-ups you may only be able to do a few kilograms or a few pounds over your head while you're doing it but you're actually getting stronger in functional ways. And that's what counts, not I can bench press 220. Yeah, that, that's a really good point. And actually, it's why I would always recommend, um, I, I know I, I'm con- contradicting myself here because previously I said, it doesn't matter what leg exercise you do as long as it's something you enjoy. But I think the exception is I would always have pull-ups in your program for that exact reason. Because 
pull-ups keep you in check. You know, you if you just optimized for you a big bench press, as you say, then the the big the guys with the biggest bench presses in the world are pretty obese. You know, they're they're really big fat guys, and like that's fine if you want to win a bench press competition. But if you want to be in all round good shape, if you get good at pull-ups, it's self correcting. Yeah, and and it, you, the reason that some of those guys, like the world's strongest man and all that, are as large as they are, is because mass requires mass. It's just it's just straight physics. Like you need yeah. you need weight in order to you know have the kinetic potential to be able to move that much weight around. Um, and to your point about like uh, Turkish get-ups with a, a child and kind of being you know like the Greek story of Milo, you know that one where he like is he carried a pig up the hill and i think it's um, a sheep but yeah like he carried okay. like a baby lamb up up a, up a hill every day and then as the lamb got a bit larger and larger and larger he got stronger and stronger and stronger i think he actually just carried with him everywhere i think he was just always walking around <laughs> with a sheep actually um i think i should start doing that i've I'm thought about that a sheep after this podcast yeah yeah i've thought about that and then okay so I've, i was actually been meaning to bring this up this whole time uh do you know who pavel tatsalin is yeah okay so i'm so like my workout routine my stack is uh, I do strong first, so I do a lot of his like kettlebell work, um, and I integrate his kettlebell work with this guy named Elvaro Romero. Do you know about him? He's uh, I've Brazilian. Never heard of him. He does uh, gymnastica natural, like natural gymnastics is his thing. Um, if you know, do you know the Gracies with jujitsu? Oh uh, yeah. Yeah, he grew up in the same circle as them. Was actually their trainer while they were becoming like the top MMA people in the world. Uh, cool. Um, so and he's uh, developed this body weight exercise so I, I i've integrated that um strong first with um natural you know, gymnastica and then i do yoga like that's kind of like and then you know cardio and stuff like that so that's kind of like my spread but one of the things that pavel actually uses with that milo example uh is that you can't do that like you're you're the the growth of a animal is gonna be greater than your ability to like strong and and progressively increase with it which goes back to your point again which is and the one that Pavel is actually the one that completely flipped my thinking of this, which is you shouldn't exercise so that you feel sore and you can't work that muscle group again, because then that's going to make your days hell. But also yeah. it's going to mean like, it, you know, God forbid a drastic, drastic situation happens where you actually need to use all of the strength that you've been able to build up. You're not going to be able to do that. That you, you have to do an eight week peaking cycle just so right. that like on, on the ninth week you can perform at your best. Yeah. And th th this is it. I think it's a kind of a difference between looking at like, am I going to train like a purist bodybuilder and have like different parts of my body sore as hell and just wrecked for most of the week? Or am I going to be a power lifter and only, com you know, only compete once every six months and get really good at three specific movements and, you know, hell to everything else, or am I generally training to get stronger, look better, feel better in my body? And, you know, broadly you're doing the same kind of stuff, but they, they will take you in different directions depending on what you, where you set that, that North star. So you've got to be quite, quite deliberate about it. Yeah. Which I think is another, I think, uh, I'm not sure if intentional or not that another probably important aspect that you bring to your coaching, which is what is your goal, right? So it's, let's get this understanding of foundation and what our foundation should be, you know, and how that nutrition, lifestyle, mental health, and exercise are actually all part of the same thing. Then let's get you a plan that you enjoy and you're going to be able to, that, you know, my words, decrease friction. Um, and then as a part of that, what are you trying to aim for? You know, like I, I try to flip everyone to be like vitality. Like you should be thinking mm. about how to be feeling your best and how to live that way the longest. It's funny because what do you want is a really hard question to answer. <laughs> and if, uh, you know, I, I think I'm still experiencing problems of chasing certain goals, you know, where looking back 10 years ago, I might have said, oh, I really want that metric or that outcome and then you get there and you might have achieved the outcome but you didn't account for all of the side effects or all the costs associated with getting to that point um even going through med school you know completing med school had a had an impact on my body and on my baseline level of stress and anxiety so but if you think about going for a goal there's always going to be associated costs and i guess you've got to price those into the decisions otherwise 
you you end up with you know same with things like oh i want a million tiktok followers i i don't but you know if that, <laughs> if that was the thing okay like you probably could do it if you really followed the the methods and got an agency to help and did everything to get a million tiktok followers then you get there and you realize that you that comes with a lot of negative consequences that you probably didn't anticipate whereas in your case if you said i I want to optimize for vitality and feeling good in my body there's fewer negative side effects of getting there because it's closer to the 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 actual satisfaction and goal that you're looking for rather than something that's once or twice removed from the satisfaction yeah and this goes to your answer last time we were talked which is you enjoy making progress Right. And, and I think it's we, we prize milestones as opposed to prizing the effort. Right. So like I could say I want to. OK, like I, I want to be like two, 210 pounds. Like that's like my goal right now is I'm at like 190 ish and I want to get to 210 because I know that I'm, I'm 6'3". And I know me 6'3", 210 is like a perfect walking around weight where I know that I can have the mass to be able to do what I do now with, you know, 40, 50 pound kettlebells with 72 pound kettlebells, I know I'll have the mass that I'll be able to like most likely not get injured if I do things properly. Um, and I also know that I'm not carrying too much of a body weight that when I run or do those type of things, I'm like hammering my joints. Right. So like, that's what I, it's, that's, there's a milestone, but really what I'm trying to not think about, I try not to think about that. I try to think about, well, I want to be optimal. And if I'm optimal, I need to get to that weight because that's going to mean when I play basketball, it's going to be hard to push me around, you know, and so on yeah. and so forth. You, you've articulated that a lot more concisely than I, than I could, which is that there's a trade-off between chasing any goal. You're going to have to sacrifice something else. And so getting too heavy, yes, you can lift more weight, et cetera, but you're also sacrificing athleticism and toll on your joints. And I used to be, so I'm, I'm very short. I'm like five, eight, five, nine. Um, it's average. And, Fair enough. <laughs> I, I've just got a small man syndrome inside. Um, and I used to be 90 kilograms, 91, which is about 203 pounds, I think, which I got shin splints all the time from doing gymnastics because I was trying to achieve both being heavy and muscular and doing gymnastics and tumbling, which is not not designed for a, a that BMI. So the consequence was the shin splints and having my back hurting all the time. And so it was only when I lost weight that I became a better gymnast and I felt better in my body. So it's, there's always these trade-offs. Yeah, no, totally. Or like another example. And then, you know, we can, I won't constantly keep bringing myself up, but uh, like my ambitions of where I want to go with my career and the type of life I want to live, I understand it comes with a social cost. Like I don't hang out with people as much. I spend most of yeah. my nights working. You know what I mean? And even when it's the weekends, like I'm, I I value family above anything else. And then second to that is I value my goals. So like I'm sacrificing constantly. I don't, you know, I'm not hanging out with people as much as I normally would. I'm probably living more like a 50, 60 year old man uh, at the age that I am um, because of that. And that's, and, but see, to me, like I'm aware of those trade-offs and and I'm aware of also the negativity of that. Cause what that ends up meaning is I'm now in this paradoxical state where it's like i probably should be socializing more than i am because when i do socialize i kind of get annoyed and i feel like that muscle is becoming like a stasis Mm. but that's key though that you're aware of the trade-offs i think where people go wrong is when they're not aware of them they bury themselves down a certain rabbit hole and then they look up and they go oh god my life has taken me somewhere where i don't really want to be totally yeah no i completely agree with that um, so tell me some more about like the coaching that you're doing for other coaches. So you, you have like a, a, it seems like a solid program for how to get people in. How do you do that to help other people help other people? Yeah. So this was a, just from a marketing error that we made early on, which was as you, as you know, from speaking to me, that the, the type of content that we do was quite cerebral, quite physiology heavy, um, and didn't really have mass appeal. And so the people who resonated with us were other coaches and other trainers who kind of got it and just wanted the accountability of, of the, the stuff that we had to offer and the synthesis of the information. As that progressed, we started to get people say, hey, I'm also a coach. Can you help me with my systems to coach my own clients? Mm-hmm. And so really just from running propane and 
eventually turning it into not just a coaching business, but a leveraged coaching business with group programs and systems and automation that people saw that and thought, oh, well, you guys have done it. Can you help me achieve the same thing for my brand? So we just thought we, we, we helped a couple of people informally to begin with. And we thought, actually, this is a process that's quite replicable as long as someone is able to generate a result for their client, but they're struggling to market it, then we can help them with that part of it. We, you know, we can't polish a turd. We can only help people that um, can already get a result for their client. But um, so, yeah, we, we turned that into a, a separate process. So now the business has two arms. So we still do some of the nutrition and fitness coaching, but we also help coaches and trainers to, to basically monetize their own services and expertise. Interesting. You can't polish a turd, but you can turn it into fertilizer. Um, how, uh, how, how are you doing that? How are you going about like getting other people into this type? So like, are you focusing on like the ethos part of it and how to get like that type of it? Or are you focusing more in the raw, like formula of this is how you get followers and subscribers and all that? Yeah. So we, well, uh, because we failed at the organic game, um, we still managed to, to generate consistent sales and and deliver to those people without going viral on Instagram or, or anything. And, and so, and and actually from working with a lot of big influencers, they optimized for followers, but often a lot of these guys who are, or or women who look like they've got hundreds of thousands of followers and seem like they're doing so well financially, they're not doing great and they have to rely on brand deals and stuff. So it's not always the, it's not always the, the people who are perceived as successful that are that are doing the best um so we realized that actually chasing the organic hamster wheel is is not a sustainable business model and also you we we've all seen the instagram algorithm change overnight and then people suddenly lose half their engagement and can't generate the same sales so our process is very much about delivering some value running targeted ads getting people into your world onto your email list and turning that into traffic that you control rather than being at the mercy of the algorithms. You can still play those games if you want to, but recognize that you're renting traffic from those people. So it's taking the best of your content, the the stuff that you can get someone a result with in a short time. We have a sales mechanism that compresses that into a process that someone new to your world can enter it, get a good result for themselves, realize that you're the real deal, generate some credibility and then um you pitch your your ongoing or recurring program and then that's a that's a a sales mechanism that you can repeat and you can copy and paste and so you're getting results for people they're happy the difference as well is that we recommend charging mid-ticket prices so anything between 50 pounds or say 50 dollars to about 200 dollars a month there are a lot of sort of six figure fit pro business guru people who recommend high ticket at the moment. It can work, but we don't recommend it because first of all, trying to deliver value on a $5,000 fat loss program is very difficult. Generally doesn't get repeat customers. It generally requires a lot of emotionally manipulative sales calls and that kind of thing. That's the stuff that these people teach. Um, and it's, it's just not, it's not something that someone makes as a, an off the cuff purchase. <laughs> so mid ticket, the customers are happier. They stay for longer. And ironically, that means that the lifetime value of those clients is higher as well. So overall it fits together as a much better system, more, more repeatable. You then don't have to spend thousands and thousands on Facebook ads because the, um, the cost per acquisition of a client is much lower. That's awesome. That's like a, you, you stumbled upon like a, a business truth. Um, I don't sure if it was intentional or not, but that's, that's great. Um, so focus on authenticity, focus on getting organic growth in the way of being able to control your users, subscribers, all of that. So direct engagement over waiting for, you know, gaming the algorithm, um, in order to, to get, a flash in the pan only to be at the whim of the next time it changes. Yeah, exactly. And if, if you can build your email list over time, I know some people consider email list to be a type of social media 
and it is in a way, but it's the difference is your email list is a spreadsheet. <laughs> it's not a, it's not a list of usernames on Twitter's server or Instagram server. So you own that. And if you switch to Active Campaign or Infusionsoft or whatever, you take that with you. So no one can take that away from you. And that's people who have deliberately opted in saying, I want to hear more about this. And I'm very long on email because it's someone has given you the privilege of direct access to their personal inbox rather than a chance at being seen on their feed when they're scrolling on something. To totally. Um, email... I don't know how that's going to... Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I don't mean to cut you off. Go ahead and finish your thought. Well, I, I, I don't know how things are going to change with changes to Gmail and I know they're trying to separate promotion from services from these different categories of email, but at least for now and the foreseeable future, it's it's still the the most valuable contact or subscriber type that you can get for someone. Yeah, hopefully in, in due time, uh, bandwidth media is going to overtake Gmail because Gmail is a, a surveillance system that I won't get into, but hopefully that oh, goes really? away very... Yeah, yeah, there's there's plans. We can talk about it after we stop recording. But um, I think that email lists and newsletters are actually not social media. I think it's the modern magazine. Newsletters, yeah, I suppose it's the equivalent to a physical magazine being delivered to your right. house. Exactly, month, isn't it? Yes, and you have to subscribe to it. Um, it's they have your information. They're directly able to access you. I think that is the holy grail right now. Um, I think there's a lot of. I think it's an untapped area that could be improved. But it, and regardless, I think at the moment, um, I think it's uh, it's the best way to get authentic people to to be listening to you. Like I'm, I'm notoriously incredibly difficult to get a hold of so like people that start to get to know that will start going to my wife to get a hold of me and <laughs> i i really do feel bad that that happens because it happens rather frequently or like friends or friends of friends of ours will like go through her um but even still i subscribe to, to email newsletters and knowing that i'm like incredibly difficult to get a hold of they get me still um, oh, that's interesting mm -hmm. I, I feel bad for your wife having to i do too <laughs> having to field all of that yeah but yeah i do i actually we were talking about this last night because someone was was messaging her because they weren't getting a response from me and, and <laughs> <laughs> it's not that um, i don't respond i just i only want to respond when i can have the targeted amount of energy to respond and well, I, I, the, i'm okay if it's less than seven days so so what what makes me sad about this is that this used to be the norm and we are old yes. enough to remember like not even that long ago when, when we were 15 it was normal you know, a quick response to a text message, like an SMS where you're typing on the T9 keyboard, was 48 hours. Yeah. Now, if so, if you don't respond to someone's text within five, 10 minutes, they or sometimes they'll send a follow-up or like a question mark. Are you mad at me? Like, unbelievable. <laughs> like, yeah. how has this become? Like, we. It's the, if you look at the percentage change on how fast a typical response is, that's really concerning like i find it viscerally frightening that um that this is how we're expected to be so deeply attached to our devices and i think you you touched on touched on it there that it, i think it's admirable that you've created structures that you're not immediately accessible all the time so you can just think a bit more clearly and that should be the normal it that what's abnormal or what's um harmful is that we're all just there's no filters to what can get into us now the analogy that i use is we're usually quite discerning over what we put into our mouths yes there's problems with the food industry we talked about but like you wouldn't go and like pick up a stone off the floor and put it in your mouth <laughs> but we're totally indiscriminate with what we put into our minds in fact we mm -hmm. let other people put things into our minds and it's equivalent to walking down a street and letting people come up to you and just like put things in your mouth and you don't know what it is so I think there's really a lot of value in being deliberate about the content that you consume. And it's slipped by us because we're all used to there being five television channels and yep. there was programming and it was all very predictable. Whereas as things have evolved, it's got to the point where stuff is now being pushed onto us. And there was no conscious step that any of us really made to go, oh, hang on. What if I don't want to consume this? And so 
unsubscribing from everything and choosing to very deliberately pick the information sources that that you actively and consciously choose to consume is so much mentally healthier for you. 100%. Yeah, totally. It's the boiling the frog. This is the best analogy of if you throw a, a frog into a boiling pot of water, it's going to jump right out. But if you slowly mm. turn up the heat, it'll boil itself alive and it, it won't even notice it, right? And I think that's what's happened with all this different tech. If it's in all the different... Okay, so like um, be, while this episode that we're recording will have will be going out um we're recording it before the what i'm about to reference has gone out but there's this guy named gerald pollack who's discovered structured water so there's four phases of water we know solid liquid gas there's actually a fourth phase that's called structured water i think it needs to go through some type of branding exercise to be called something different because we don't call steam evaporated water but we call this fourth phase structured water right now um but uh he um he talks a lot about, uh, um, I lost my train of thought all of a sudden. We were just talking so about. We, we were talking about the lack of filter, lack of barriers for information coming, coming into us. Oh yeah. Yeah. And that boiling the frog. Yeah. So, um, you know, if you don't know that that's happened, that things are happening, right? If you don't know that there's this overload, oh, this is what it is. Okay. So. He came up with this structured water thing, right? His discovery, which is only to to call to that episode and say that the point that he makes is that there's been no foundational scientific discoveries in the past 30 years that have fundamentally changed our lives, right? I think he's actually discovered one. Um, I think the fourth phase of water is unbelievable. It like what you're talking about. We're talking about basic foundational things, like even in the way that muscles move, requires structured water, which is fascinating. Um, which you, I think you probably find very interesting. Um, but I think his point is, is brilliant. It's, and it's perfectly on point. And the only things that we've seen advancement in is information technology. And I can tell you from being deeply embedded in that field that that's actually not a true innovation, that what we're playing on is Moore's Law, which is the fact that every nine months, the processing power is going to double, which we're going to hit a point where it's not going to be able to do anymore because we're actually going to get to the point before we hit record where we're playing with the foundational physics of the structure of an atom. So that actually is going to run out. We can get into like quantum computing. Quantum computing is totally going to be a revolution. However, you're talking about something that requires massive amounts of info. It's, it's a tool for certain things. It's not going to work for everything. Right. Um, which is to say like we've unknowingly, accepted two things into our daily lives, which is one, we're, we're living in a hyper-dominated information technology world, and we've actually given up all growth in other fields for this artificial growth in information technology. And one of the byproducts of it is now information technology is overloading us constantly in such a way it's manipulating us that it's even manipulating the fact, to Gerald Pollack's point, that we haven't had any foundational revolutions in anything else but we, we just see all this advancement in AI and all these things and we subscribe, you know, a fundamental change, but it's not actually there. There's a lot there. I'm talking, if I'm talking, yeah. it's probably a lot there. It's just like, this is something I'm, I'm keen to look into because I've, I've heard people mention structured water and I've never really got to a, um, I've never come to a conclusion about whether it's, bullshit well yeah and what 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 to make of it really um but yeah i'll, I'll have to reserve comment until i've until i've looked into it more there's a lot of grifters there's grifters in anything right there's grifters in like the blockchain web3 stuff um and then there's also grifters in this structured water thing um i think jerry goes a really amazing line between expressing what is the scientific discovery that he's made versus what is the potential and what it, do we actually know? I suppose also like anyone who challenges a, a scientific paradigm is going to come across as a quack until something, until they've got strong evidence. You know, there's no one who goes, oh yeah, well that's really sensible because yeah. <laughs> otherwise it would be within the realm of what's known. Final final question for you, John. Yeah. Is, um, do you have any crypto holdings at the moment? Yeah, but I'm not heavy in it. Okay. What's your, what, 
What are your thoughts about the recent crash? I mean, at the time of recording this, there's been um, a significant drop, I think, below mm-hmm. the support structures that have been expected. Um, are you still long, mm-hmm. long-term, long or what are your thoughts? Yeah, I am, actually. Um, I think that you have to bifurcate what's happening. So you got to split it into two, and then you have to understand that both of those things don't exist. Because So, okay, I'm going to throw a little philosophy, and then I'll answer your question. In Taoism... Um, there's the symbol of Taoism is the yin yang. And the point of that is that you can split things into two and you can say, you know, something's black and white, the good and bad, but the, the central driver of both of those things is the other. So the central driver of whatever is black is a little bit of white. That's actually driving it. Right. Mm-hmm. Which is the point that that's trying to make is that the duality actually doesn't exist. That the whole is the circle, not how you're looking at it in those two different ways. So I'm going to split this into two things, but I think it's all still the same whole. That was my setup for that. So I think you have two different parts with crypto, right? You have the financial aspect of it, which is crypto. And then you have the technology aspect of it, which is blockchain and Web3, right? So I'm still bullish on both, but I'm not bullish on crypto in the way that most people are, okay? So I think in crypto, there's Bitcoin and then there's everything else. And I think that's all that there is. So Bitcoin is brilliant and the lightning network that's built on top of it is even more brilliant. Um, and I think that that actually is, has a lot of promise. Now people are going to say like, oh yeah, but it doesn't have, it's not attached to anything. It's not attached to any value. Well, guess what? Neither is anything. Money isn't. Yeah. Right. I th- <laughs> right? Like I, th- I think that's always the irony of that particular argument. Right. I mean, I, I'm, I'm very ignorant with the whole um, technology of crypto, but from a basic sort of economic theory perspective to say there's no underlying value behind Bitcoin. It's like, well, that's kind of a moot point. <laughs> yeah. And the only thing that's the power between the United States dollar dollar is two things. It's the fact that up until recently, all energy exchange in the world was tied to the petrodollar, which is the US dollar. So that's and that that and then the fact that we have the largest military in the world. Like that is actually what is the basis for uh the United States dollar, right? Um so, okay, so all money is only the value that we subscribe subscribe to it. And I think because of that, I think Bitcoin is most likely going to be the one that wins out. Um, and I think it's going to win out in a pretty big way because I think it's creating another international class of people who are bridging the gap between borders. And also, I think because of the fact that just like the United States dollar was tied to the you know oil market, and that's been the power of you know, it's been the driving, okay, like, I have a lot of concerns about way inflation is going worldwide, and particularly in the US, because of how much everything you touch is affected by the price of oil. It's it's infected in everything. And we can talk about nutrition and how there's oil products in like things that we eat, you know, things that we eat on, you know, all of that. Mm -hmm. And it's terrible. Um, It's terrible for like the the estrogen, that article that you wrote. And it's also terrible because it it means that we're uh, beholden to a lot of people who do crazy things like Mohammed bin Salam will, you know, lure a journalist that was, is a supporter of his regime actually, um, into a, you know, consulate in Turkey and then, uh, kill him and then chop him up into little pieces and put him into a, a, a vat of acid to just, you know, just dismember it and get rid of the body. Like that's actually what happened. Right. So you end up having that where Bitcoin, I think jumps ahead and it says, Hey, instead of tying it to the means of energy, tie it to energy itself. So like what Bitcoin is actually transacting is energy. And if you are mining energy, what you're actually doing is you're supporting the energy infrastructure right there now and what could potentially be needed for a later time. So you're you're actually saying, instead of saying, we're going to tie the value of it, of this dollar to what is the fundamental driver of, an ener- of a resource for the economy, you're going to just going to say the fundamental driver of the economy is not the resource, it's the energy. So let's tie everything mm-hmm. to the energy. So I think that that is an interesting part about Bitcoin. That is interesting. And it's it's kind of unintentional. It's intentional, well, I, though. Satoshi so, Nakamoto, so, he, he did it intentionally. If you read the okay. Bitcoin white paper, he did it for two reasons. One was this concept of energy. And then the other one is the fact that of scarcity and the fact that, uh, you know, throughout time, like you can look at Romans, Parthians, Scythians, they all get into mm-hmm. a financial trouble and they deflate the currency. Yeah. So the scarcity thing I understood, I didn't realize it was by design, <clears throat> the energy energy part of it. But I'd love to chat to you 
um, more about that, but it would, it would be very much, um, me asking you questions and trying to, <laughs> trying to, trying to understand this. Cause I, um, I, I took my eye off the ball with this whole crypto thing. I was just kicking myself cause I, I didn't, I didn't buy any back in 2013 or whatever when, yeah, me too. When, when I was, yeah, when I was, it was first mentioned to me. And, um, so since then I've just had sour grapes and be like, oh, well it's shit anyway. I don't <laughs> but, but realistically I, I do hold some and, um, I just wish I'd got in earlier. Um, John, I've, uh, I've got another call now, so I'm going to have to dash, but absolutely loved doing this one. Um, and oh, it's a pleasure. Know, very happy if, if you would tolerate me once more, of course. Um, then, uh, I would love to, would love to have another chat in, uh, in a few weeks time. Yeah, let's do that. I would love that. You can ask me any questions and all that. We can go into web three. That sounds excellent. Um, Amazing. well, thank you again for your time. Uh, propanefitness.com and I'll, I'll, any of the things that we talked about, I'll try to put into the show notes. Um, thanks again. Amazing, man. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. You too.